Hello, welcome to this talk on Autism Spectrum Disorder. I'm Magnus Bein, MD, PhD, and uh, thank you for coming and listening. I look forward to your comments. This lecture is going to be about 35 minutes long, and in this lecture we'll touch on a historic perspective looking at autism's emergence as a diagnosis in contemporary time. We'll go over the definition as it's used now in North America, and I'll discuss what we know about its uh, prevalence and causes, as well as some of its challenges for management. We'll look briefly at the social-cultural aspects too, um, and that's where we'll finish. I recommend further reading and videos. They're in the comments section of this video, and hopefully that'll give you a re more realistic and richer sense of what autism means for people as well as a glimpse into the psychology and the diversity with autism. Okay, so what is autism? Uh, also known as autism spectrum disorder, it's a fairly recent term for a likeness that's likely been part of humanity for quite a long time. Overall, it's a deficit in social communication with a lack of shared emotions. It has a neurocognitive and genetic basis. So basically it's an inability to socially bond, pair bond, and understand others' emotions. So why is it a disorder? Well, this is uh, quite subjective and this is where the spectrum comes in. If there's no disturbance in an individual level of functioning, whether actual or desired, then there's really no disorder no need for a diagnosis and no reason to treat or attend to autism. So in such a case, there's a difference between those who would be labeled with autism and those without, and that's mostly like a personality type because the person's generally at home within their psychosocial environment where they live, work, play, socialize, etc. So since all societies at different scales uh, even families have different normative behavior, a disorder would be a consistent deviation from those norms. So long as someone on the autism spectrum is not integrated into the social structure and exhibit a degree of behavior that wouldn't be considered normal, then we would call it a disorder. And so in this sense, there'd be a mismatch between the individual and the social group's expectations. And then a subsequent lack of a ability to play a role in that group or society. So this is important because it just reminds us, you know, you as future psychologists or people in healthcare uh, or any helping profession, teachers, even parents, um, that we all play a role in defining what this deviance from social expectation is. So we shouldn't take this process lightly. Um, I also want to note, make a note on labels. As I go through the history and background of autism, there's gonna be offensive terms that come up and that's purely how they were used historically and they were actually accepted by the medical establishment at the time. They're not now, um, as you'll see, I'll highlight those. Um, so I just wanted to give a caveat that those will come up, but it's basically for the purposes to highlight the social and cultural conditions that influence the treatment of people that we would now maybe say have or had autism. And that gives us a perspective on where we've come as a society and potentially also question how our own current views are colored and maybe problematic, even in the establishment standards uh, of care today. So when we're looking at ASD, now we're gonna to have to consider the relationships between the disorder and the person and how we label them um, and whether that enables or inhibits well-being or conversely stigma. So even the term patient can impose a judgment. So I wanna be mindful and just acknowledge that there is, um, we need to take care and sensitivity in how we use these labels. I'm coming from a biomedical background, psychiatry, a psychiatric background, so I think of patient populations, groups sharing a diagnosis or cluster of symptoms and behaviors. And this isn't meant to strip away the diversity and humanity of individuals, um, 
although thinking that way risks that. So there is a sparse history of autism. There's not much recorded, but we do have some interesting cases which I'll touch on. And there's also some great literature um, that I've read and I've found um, that may capture the sort of uh, the experience of being autistic. Um, obviously, that's up for interpretation and debate, but I want to point you to these great novels um, from the French Gustave Flaubert, Le Cœur Simple, uh, and The Idiot by Dostoevsky. And they, I like these because they deal with the, the sort of contradiction of someone appearing normal but having some strange behaviors and it goes into their inner world um, and it reveals sort of an unexamined tragic life of outcasts um, whose social acceptance and fitting is gauged by their utility um, in service. So it, I think it's a good criti critical look at where we are. So going historically, uh, we have the case of the silent madness of Hugh Blair of Bor, who is Scottish, around uh, the mid 1700s. This came to the court because his brother was challenging his right ability to be married and potentially have an heir to protect the brother's uh, estate and inheritance. And so dozens of witnesses were called who knew Hugh as a child um, and at the time he, the court case happened. It was around, he was around 39 years old. Um, and they all testified to features that we would uh, likely associate with autism. Um, their sort of repetitive habits, obsessions, a lack of understanding of social norms. Um, and I invite you to look at this case if you're interested. I provide a link for it. Um, and it's interesting because there's extensive witness accounts that we can reconstruct the history, excluding, say, uh, childhood um, infection that could have led to some um, neurological dysfunction. Um, so we, this is a pretty interesting case to look at. There's the Enfant Sauvage, Victor of Avignon. This is around... Um, 1800, the turn of the century. Um, and a child aged around 11 years old was found in the woods in the country uh, in France. And he appeared disheveled, his hair was tangled, he had uh, scars, bruises, uh, was malnourished, ran on all fours, he defecated wherever. Um, and he appeared to be a wolf child, but uh, in later retrospective analysis of historic accounts, it looks like these scars were from um, physical abuse at the hands of either his parents or whoever initially raised, uh, raised him. And it's not known if he had a predisposing disability like a, a developmental delay or a learning disability um, and thus was abused because he couldn't, for example, talk um, or if it's for some other reason. In any case, he had signs of mental disturbance, uh, grinding teeth, rocking back and forth. He had spasmodic movements, so he may have had epilepsy. The people who found them sent him to Paris for rehabilitation, and he was taken in by Dr. Itard. And Itard developed some of the early treatments for rehabilitating children with um, deafness and whatnot. Now, Victor wasn't deaf, but he couldn't speak. And so Itard trained him to learn the alphabet and to communicate, basically. And while he couldn't communicate in full sentences, he could use some single words and he could also convey his emotions and also respond to other people. So Victor Vavrignon is a really interesting person because he's maybe one of the earliest um, documented cases of uh, potentially autistic or having a language delay who is able to be helped basically and showed some improvement. The next example is Billy the Idiot. 
um, around 18, the mid 1800s. And this was in Massachusetts. The colonial government commissioned a census of all the idiots. And this was a term that was established and accepted medically. Um, and they were trying to determine what to do with these people. Um, and what's interesting about this is the physicians who are involved in the census and directly examine these people, they would go to their village, Billy, Billy number 27 being an example, they'd be examined and interviewed. And it was not only with Billy, but several, many others in this survey where they, they could say, they couldn't quite call them an idiot per se. Now that's very derogatory, but this was how they thought at the time. And it was interesting that they questioned that and they could acknowledge that there was some aspects of superior cognition. Um, so for example, Billy could, couldn't could understand uh, verbal directions. If someone asked him to go milk a cow, he wouldn't do it. He would just repeat himself for a couple hours. But if someone mined it and then gave him a bucket and he would go and he'd come back a little while later with a bucket full of milk. Um, he could also sing upwards of 200 um, songs in like perfect key and pitch. So he had some extraordinary abilities, but also just didn't have other communication abilities. And so this led people like Billy, who were in this census, led the, um, the commissioners to, to question how they they labeled and diagnosed these people. So that brings us to the contemporary emergence of autism as a definition and a diagnosis. Um, in here, we have some early accounts, including ones that I've mentioned here. Um, Fools for Christ, I've showed some paintings earlier, um, and that was basically an aspect of of medieval and Renaissance society of people who were obsessed uh, with religion and could have suffered from some kind of mental illness. Autism, severe autism may have been one of them. In any case, in the 1900s, Bloehler was uh, the first to coin the term autistic. And this was for one of his uh, pediatric or children schizophrenia patients and he meant to talk it to use the term as a form of extreme isolation and so aut autism comes from the Greek word auto meaning self and um, and so it's interesting he bases on one case now as we know there's world wars not much progress was made until the 40s when Kanner and Asperger published some cases, um, still just a handful, and they agglom agglomerated different symptoms, and they felt that their groups of patients represented a new category. And Kanner had the more severe cases, which sort of had uh, an effective kind of psychosis that he was trying to capture. And Asperger had um, an even smaller group, and they weren't as severe, and actually I think about three of the four went on to win Nobel Prizes but they did have some patterns of uh, communication and social interaction deficits. And what's interesting is these, these seem to define the, the ends of a spectrum, um, but it wasn't until recently that that was acknowledged. And around that time in the 40s, Kanner with Bettelheim proposed a mechanism um, called the refrigerator mums theory. Um, you can see right here in the history. It was around the same period, and this was sort of a psychoanalytical view that uh, to answer how would these uh, communication and social interaction uh, habits or behaviors emerge. And so they looked at the parents and they, they thought and they proposed that a withdrawn, aloof, sort of callous parenting figure would result in a child developing similar uh, behaviors. 
And so this was the theory of the time, and it wasn't until later, as the diagnosis uh, increased uh, among uh, professor and other professional families, that this was challenged. And so it wasn't until the 1960s that alternative views of causes of autism came up, like the neurological basis. There was also chemical agents that were suspected in um, vaccines, for example. And then later, genetic explanations came in. And it's important to note that in the late 90s, vaccines were given widespread attention despite consistently showing there was a lack of causal evidence. Now at the same time, the DSM was capturing this definition. And so in the first and second edition, autism was actually part of childhood schizophrenia. And that's true to Bliller's sort of initial definition of the term. And so this was in 19, the 1950s and 60s. Until the DSM-3, which is in 1980, where autism was separated out from childhood schizophrenia. And then DSM-4, which was in 94, created different categories. And autism was one of these five types under pervasive developmental disorders. And this mirrors the current ICD-10 classification. Now, um, the DSM-5 was published in 2013, and this is the definition we use today, and they reverted back to um, a spectrum disorder. So they separated it out from pervasive development disorders. So just to wrap up um, this sort of background and history, I wanted to provide this what at autism is not, as we can uh, get a sense in the history and even the contemporary development, there was a lot of going back and forth and proposing things that were not necessarily based on evidence or didn't stand up to the test of evidence. And so in black, I have the sort of stigmatized and really arbitrary definitions um, that were attributed and la later shown not to have anything to do with autism. So starting with the village idiot idea and the wolf child, those are clearly not um, what autism is, and yet in the early history, it, it is likely there was some of that sort of stigma attached to it. Um, you know, the social isolation could result in some uh, deficiencies in communications. So institutionalization, for example, um, but not leading to a diagnosis of idiocy. And so this, this shows just how pervasive some of the stigmatizing and um, um, harmful uh, definitions uh, were accepted in the past. Um, so you'll see in purple, I have actually more legitimate um, comorbidities that could be associated but not necessarily be autism per se. And so we have social deprivation, we have language disorders, brain infections, brain injury, deafness, deafness, dysphagia, not being able to eat, which can also be tied to inability to speak, epilepsy, intellectual disability, schizophrenia, and disintegrative disorder, which is very rare con pediatric condition. So these are things that can present with autism, but they're not the cause per se, or they can result in autistic-like uh, symptoms and behaviors. So we've come a long way, and um, the DSM grappled with some of the more legitimate aspects of what, what is associated with autism. We can see the framework that they use in the center. We have the definition of autism and the, the three main categories of social impairment, some deficits in communication, and repetitive behaviors. But it's also linked to other diagnoses or associated, like ADHD, social anxiety, OCD is a little further out, intellectual disability. There's also associated symptoms that are quite common like sleep disturbances, um, GI dysfunction, epilepsy, 
So autism is complex because it presents with other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and so this slide is meant to just show how that can progress through uh, a person's life if they have a diagnosis of autism. Um, so looking at this diagram on the right, we can see in childhood anxiety, ADHD, phobias, and even oppositional conduct disorder can be fairly frequently seen in children that also have a diagnosis of autism. We can see too a main branch is the association of intellectual disabilities which will impact um, how they're, they're treated and managed and um, we can see also that the co-occurrence of other conditions like anxiety and ADHD still can be associated but generally goes down. And in adulthood there can be residual comorbidities like anxiety and then new ones like depression and OCD. So these are all important to consider in the complexity of autism but, and they come depending on the individual with with the presentation of autism but not in all cases. So to summarize up to half of the cases of people with autism also have an intellectual disability. About half or up to half can have ADHD. A third, up to a third can have epilepsy. And actually interestingly, 25% have a known genetic mutation. So autism now, we're dealing with a spectrum disorder that's defined by level of functioning from um, a high functioning autism which is a mild form to severe um, and so this is basically the conventional spectrum that's that's seen as part of autism and the criteria are basically based on two main components a s impaired social interaction and communication uh, where there's a lack of social repre reciprocity, nonverbal communication, so a lack of understanding of nonverbal cues, and uh, difficulty in maintaining and understanding relationships. The other main component is a restricted and repetitive uh, behavior. So this can include stereotyped behaviors, so hair pulling, ear pulling, um, tics, um, shaking or swaying. Um, there's also some aspects that kind of look like um, an obsessive compulsive sort of picture, which is this rigidity and insistence on sameness and having restricted fixed interests. And one ar area that um, we shouldn't overlook is a uh, hyper or hyposensitivity to s sensory stimuli so um, and so this can vary from being sensitive to textures of clothing for example versus not even feeling the cold temperature and being able to run outside for you know half an hour in the snow without shoes those are just some examples of of some of the uh, changes in perception that can also present with autism. So I'm going to touch on the neurodevelopmental aspect. So this is this is the evidence of why we consider autism a neurodevelopmental disorder. And there's basically three lines of evidence. The first is that in groups of children with an autistic diagnosis there's often accelerated head and brain growth during the first few years of life. So when looking at children who are later diagnosed with autism, we can look back in their, say, their head circumference changes. And we find that in initially they're usually in the lower 25th percent of the whole population. And then they go through uh, an acceleration in growth by about a year, they're in the 84th percentile. So this, this is a change in growth rate 
And this is pointing to changes in the brain um, that may be occurring and that's certainly shown some evidence in brain imaging. And that's the second line of evidence. So in patients and children that have received a diagnosis of autism, they can be scanned with MRI, functional MRI, or PET scans to find what areas are overactive or high, sorry, overactive or underactive. Um, and so this is sort of like reverse engineering. We know that there's um, sort of a dysfunction in social interaction. Um, there's repetitive movement behaviors. We can sort of look to see what happens in those parts of the brain that we know are linked to those functions. And interestingly, we can see that there's uh, inactivation of what's called the social brain, which I'll break down a little bit in the next slide, and also connectivity in general, especially to the visual and language centers. There's also a lot of variation in other parts of the brain that have been picked up as, as being um, either hyper or hypoactive compared to neurotypical individuals. The final uh, line of evidence is that there are dozens of genetic conditions that are associated with people who have a diagnosis and that we know impact brain development. So the social brain, um, it's involved in social interaction, in facial recognition, in empathy, in processing emotions, but it also influences connectivity to other centers. And the key parts of the brain are the orbitofrontal cortex, the temporal parietal cortex, which is in this area. So those are on the, the surface of the brain. There's also the insula that have been found to consistently be underactive. So that's a little deeper. And then the amygdala is the key part of the basal ganglia that's implicated in autism. And here's a list of known genetic syndromes that are associated with ASD. Um, one of them is a mutation caused by valproate, the medication. But all of these um, can be inherited, but mostly are what's called spontaneous mutations. So they're not actually carried by the parents. And there's something that happens in the fetal period and and early development uh, that leads to these syndromes. And what's interesting also to note is that none of them explain more than about one and a half percent of all cases. So at most we would have one or two percent of all people that have a diagnosis of autism to have say Angelman syndrome. So there's no smoking gun genetic mutation. It's, there's many genes involved in neurodevelopment and are tied to the social brain that could go out of whack. Um, and this is a sampling of, of many that we know of. Sorry, I keep changing my screen. Oh my gosh. Okay, and then there's risk factors that per potentially are uh, causal factors, but they're all we know for now is they're associated. Um, so parental age, uh, working mothers, educational level parents uh, have been shown to be associated with with uh, children that have an autism diagnosis. What's maybe more convincing as a causal factor are prenatal and obstetrical causes. An ultrasound has been explored as a potential um, risk factor. Uh, cesarean sections because there's increased risk uh, to the child to the to the neonate um, for distress and uh, hypoxia or oxygen starvation which then will will starve the brain of, of oxygen and potentially lead to damage to the neurons prematurity is also associated with those sort of stresses then there's environmental factors like drugs, toxins, pollutants that could be a factor, say, to cause a mutation, a, gen a new mutation. Um, electromagnetic waves are being explored. 
and indoor air quality again these have been shown by various studies to be associated but there's no causal link now vaccines and gluten are crossed out at the beginning and those were proposed as one time and explored to be possible causes and risk factors but they've been proven otherwise okay so next slide is the prevalence here and we've seen this dramatic increase since 1970 which is around DSM 2 DSM 3 time to its expanding definition DSM 4 was 94 and 2010 DSM 5 and we can see following these definitions there's an increase and so the prevalence is really high the Canadian prevalence matches that of the states this is data from the states from their uh, monitoring network I'll provide links to this data too you can check out and it's it's alarming how frequent it is but we have to remember that its increase is likely due to the expanding definition as we've seen historically and contemporary time rather than um, say an environmental pollutant that people are being exposed to and so more more children are developing this so that wouldn't be the case it's not like a COVID uh, infectious disease thing it's more like our diagnosis process has changed and has been more inclusive and therefore we have more cases now there's some interesting patterns when you look at um, autism and who's getting diagnosed and one of the major biases is males three or three to four times more males than females have autism and what's interesting is that when you when you do like local regional studies they often actually find even more males than females and this suggests that actually ASD is tends to be underdiagnosed in females um, and so this is an interesting issue because it basically raises uh, the question of are we biasing our diagnosis diagnostic process and assessment process to males a lot of the instruments are based on males uh, like the case studies that were published by Asperger and um, um, uh, Kanner um, rather than uh, something special about females that they're protected from autism so there's basically two hypotheses um, that this pattern of male bias is because females are neuro protected versus the camouflage hypothesis that females tend to um, be masked and not picked up by assessment and in either way this is sort of a, an a adaptation that makes ASD in females um, less observable the other aspect now especially is that on the spectrum there's mild uh, autism and Asperger syndrome has sort of been included and excluded from autism um, and it may be a mild form of ASD it's not wouldn't be the only form of mild mild ASD characterized by high achievement and what's interesting is that some studies I have one um, I have one reference here I provide the link in the comments uh, looked at sort of retrospective studies where you can go in and find in a population adults who may fulfill the criteria for autism but never received a diagnosis as a child versus those that are adults now that have the diagnosis sort of lifelong and what they found is that there's better outcomes in people with mild forms of ASD and they didn't have a childhood diagnosis and as we know with the expanding definition this has raised the prevalence very high so we have to be very careful in diagnosing mild forms of autism and make sure that the diagnosis is valid 
especially with the risk in um, poor outcomes for those that receive the diagnosis of mild autism. So then this brings us to the question of the autism spectrum and autism as a phenotype. And so some health advocates are trying to uh, highlight this sort of diversity of social functioning um, and this notion of mild autism being a spectrum. And you can actually rate yourself where you fall on the more circular spectrum where there's the different aspects of, of what um, of what autism uh, can is composed of and just rating yourself to see where you fall on the spectrum and this acknowledges the diversity and the heterogeneity of of social skills and and norms so in diagnosing autism you can see in this diagram on the right here, there's many co-occurring and potentially overlapping psychiatric conditions and neurological conditions that can share some features with autism. So it's important to do a thorough assessment and um, identification depends on the age. And this is a childhood thing. so. Um, at different ages there will be different presentations and usually the later it presents the less severe it is. And this requires kind of a detailed comprehensive and multidisciplinary evaluation involving many different workers, physicians, uh, school counselors, psychologists, the parents. And there's many diagnostic tools and they're not used in isolation. So there's not one test that can um, diagnose autism. It's the whole picture and putting the whole picture together. So something like IQ is not even used. Um, and that's in part because it's irrelevant. If there's an intellectual disability, there's gonna be a, a individualized uh, management approach. Family history is very important and in, in needing to account for the period of infancy and behaviors there that may have not been um, noticed by the parents, but in retrospect um, become significant and help in the, the diagnosis of autism. And obviously we need to use up-to-date criteria. So in North America, we tend to use DSM-5, whereas the rest of the world uses ICD-10. And ICD-11 will be more um, in parallel with the DSM-5, which is coming out in a couple of years. And then again, severity has to be assessed because that's the, the contemporary spectrum uh, rating. And then genetic testing is re highly recommended as standard. So treatment focuses on early and intensive behavioral training around five basic areas, any aberrant behaviors, um, and then more about sco social skills, language, and then daily living. And then there's an academic component for school performance. Parents also need to be supported and trained. And as I've highlighted, there's a lot of comorbidities. So these need to be addressed and treated. Um, and some of these comorbidities and any extreme behaviors can be treated with medication, but that's not the uh, standard mostly behavioral and training interventions. So we're just closing the talk now. Uh, I've gone over, it's about 40 minutes, apologize for that. Um, but I wanted to touch that there's health advocates, some people with a diagnosis of autism um, who are, are challenging our view of autism and arguing things like the double empathy problem. Well, where basically as I've mentioned, the issue of it being a dysfunction is this sort of mismatch between the individual with this diagnosis and their social group. And, and the double empathy problem just sort of challenges that and says, well, what if the environment changes? Will there be m as a severe dysfunction? And so that's one strategy 
treatment, and I think that's an emerging field of research. I've provided a link that you can check out a talk about that. We've also touched on neurodiversity, but this is a specific thing that advocates are raising, that um, there is a diversity in how our brains develop, that we don't need to pathologize or stigmatize or isolate people, and we can celebrate diversity. And things like the ASCII quiz, which I provided a link to, sort of start getting at that to show that, well, we all have some variation, some strengths and weaknesses, and it can be a matter of degree. And so I've provided an interesting talk about that. Um, actually, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a documentary, a very brief documentary on, on uh, adolescents with autism diagnosis, talking about their experiences and views. And then we have to challenge the stigma that um, people with any disability, with any diagnosis, or identify in any way um, are human. They have their own lives and they have a right to some degree of autonomy and self-determination um, and uh, fulfillment. And so this is a nice uh, documentary as well on uh, how autism feels from the inside. So with that, I'll leave you and I thank you again for spending the last 40 minutes with me and learning more about autism. Uh, I look forward to any comments and questions, and uh, I hope you uh, find some time to check out some of these references and check out the videos. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.